In 1704, using a series of calculations, Isaac Newton predicted the world would end sometime around the year 2060. Almost 300 years later in 1973, a computer at MIT made the prediction that life as we know it will end around the year 2040. It also predicted that some of the first signs would be seen in the year 2020. Some of its predictions have come true and scientists are taking this seriously. Let's find out why. Welcome to AI-inspired theories where smart folks like us get together to talk dirty. Now if you've got a high IQ and a good sense of humor, hit the like and subscribe buttons and that helps keep the content flowing. Across three centuries since Isaac Newton's foreboding prophecy, a parade of doomsayers has foretold the world's demise. Often these characters are a mix of fervent zealots, false prophets, and crafty charlatans. However, in the 1970s, computer scientists stepped forward with a different brew of predictions. They didn't rely on ancient texts or scriptural interpretations. Instead, they harnessed data models. Astonishingly, these scientists arrived at the same apocalyptic revelation as Newton, even pinpointing a specific date. To clarify, the end of the world here doesn't signify the planet's obliteration or the extinction of life upon it. Rather, it signifies the unraveling of society. This model draws its inspiration from the groundbreaking work of J. Wright Forrester, hailed as the founding figure of system dynamics. What the hell is that, you might be asking? Well, system dynamics is a methodology and mathematical modeling technique used to understand complex issues and problems. Okay, a little less slogany. Systems are pretty much everything. System dynamics is how pieces of the system relate to each other. For example, the deer population is a system. The resulting calculation using system dynamics is called a stock. The number of deer born is a dynamic piece of that data that adds to the population. The number of deer that die subtracts from the population, but to that model, we start adding more and more complexities. Like the birth rate of the deer, which takes into account how many deer there are, what percentage of those deer are female, and what percentage of those are likely to have offspring. We calculate their death rate by knowing how many deer there are and what is their average lifespan. Now that's a simple way to calculate deer population. But you can do all kinds of complexities to this model. Like is hunting affecting the population? And if so, what percentage of deer are killed? How often are deer killed in accidents? Do weather conditions affect the population? What about local food sources or what kinds of predators are present? You can then fine tune all these different input variables. And if your model is accurate, you can get pretty good results. Now, MIT researchers developed the program, which they called World 3, to simulate global sustainability, and it was built using system dynamics. The study looked at the five factors thought most likely to affect growth on Earth, population increase, agricultural production, non-renewable resource depletion, industrial output, and pollution generation. The scientists who participated in this research were excited to see a bright future in the results. Instead, the program predicted the end of the world. To predict what the future of worldwide growth looks like given finite planetary resources, the MIT researchers who developed the Doomsday Model were commissioned by an elite organization called the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome does sound like an Illuminati group. Oh yeah, and there are plenty of fun conspiracies about these guys. The Club of Rome was created in 1968 by the Morgantho Group during a secret meeting at Rockefeller's private estate in Bellagio. Yeah, this sounds right. The meeting was organized by Aurelio Pace, an Italian industrialist who had close ties to the Olivetti Corporation and Fiat. Now, Pace claimed to have solutions for world peace and prosperity, which could be accomplished through a new world order. And there it is. The Club of Rome was established with 75 prominent industrialists, economists, and scientists from 25 nations. The Bilderberg Group and the Club of Rome are the most important foreign policy arms of the Round Table, which is led by the Committee of 300. Well, the Round Table is a secret society that, if you believe the theory, 
is building the New World Order. The Committee of 300 is a council that creates policy for groups like the Club of Rome and the Trilateral Commission. Yeah, it's a rabbit hole. Each of these groups deserves its own video. Back to the Club of Rome and the MIT experiment. The Club of Rome acts as a research institute on political, social, and economic issues, and supposedly, NATO economic and military policy comes directly from this group. The Club of Rome claims that the future survival of mankind depends on a new global community under a single form of government. New world order, right? And the biggest threat to this new world order and the biggest threat to mankind is overpopulation. Now, it's been alleged that the Club of Rome supports massive depopulation using any means necessary. Any means means any means. In August 1980, Howard Odom, who was a member of the Club of Rome, was quoted saying, it's necessary that the US cut its population by two thirds within the next 50 years. Now, he failed to mention how this would be accomplished. So that's when the Club of Rome found unlikely but effective partners, scientists from MIT. The MIT computer program was specifically crafted to analyze the ongoing trends in pollution, consumption of natural resources, and population growth. Its objective was to forecast the potential outcomes of these trends. The Club of Rome documented the program's findings in a book titled The Limits to Growth, which was published in 1973. Upon release, some critics promptly questioned the accuracy of the data. Meanwhile, proponents argued that this skepticism stemmed from Western society's reluctance to accept responsibility. The program's results, however, painted a sobering picture. They indicated that once all these critical factors aligned, the quality of life would rapidly deteriorate, ultimately culminating in the collapse of society. This ominous convergence was projected to transpire by the year 2020. In 2020, as per the Club of Rome's report, it was undeniably a challenging year. According to their findings, the impending collapse could only be averted if nations, such as the USA and China, halted their voracious consumption of global resources, an action they were unlikely to take. However, there are some interesting observations to consider. Carbon emissions in the United States have shown a decline, and even China has claimed a slight reduction in carbon emissions compared to a year or two ago. The veracity of these claims might be questionable, but it raises intriguing questions. What the limits to growth model failed to predict is the remarkable growth explosion in emerging countries like India, Pakistan, Indonesia, the Philippines, North Korea, Peru, Sri Lanka, and Ukraine. In these nations, carbon emissions have risen between 5 and 20 percent, and over 2 billion people inhabit these regions, comprising a quarter of the world's population. These burgeoning economies are showing no signs of slowing down, and their carbon emissions continue to rise. So, it becomes evident, at least according to this model, that the risk of environmental strain remains a pressing concern. When it comes to the debate on climate change and overpopulation, it's a bit tricky to navigate. There's so much noise and emotion surrounding these issues that it's hard to discern who's right. Frankly, even I don't have the definitive answer. And the truth is, you don't either. These debates have become so emotionally charged that it's challenging to know who to trust. Now, instinctively, I'd be inclined to trust scientists from MIT on just about anything. But here's where it gets interesting. The Club of Rome had already concluded that there's an imminent threat of global collapse before they hired the MIT scientists. Coincidentally, these MIT scientists arrived at the exact same conclusion that aligns with the Club of Rome's agenda. So, can we trust this research? It's a legitimate question to ponder. Let's take a step back and consider some historical context. For a long time, tobacco companies paid scientists to publish misleading information. The most infamous example was the Frank's Statement to Cigarette Smokers, published in over 400 newspapers in 1954, which claimed there was no proof that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. Tens of thousands of doctors, including general practitioners, 
surgeons, and specialists in every branch of medicine were included in this nationwide survey. Astonishingly, the results revealed that more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And here's the kicker. In 1981, a Japanese study conclusively demonstrated the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. But once again, Big Tobacco managed to find scientists who argued otherwise. In the 90s, they even sponsored studies suggesting that dirty air filters were more dangerous to the lungs than cigarettes. It's a tough pill to swallow. Going back to the 60s, sugar companies paid scientists at Harvard to assert that sugar doesn't lead to weight gain or heart disease. And as recently as 2017, Coca-Cola and the Mars Candy Company funded research to divert attention away from their products links to obesity and diabetes. The sobering fact is that 70% of all scientific research is funded by private companies and that money often comes with strings attached. Consider this. Out of the 50 most recent food industry sponsored studies, a staggering 70% yielded results favorable to the sponsor's interests. Another 25% remained neutral and less than 5% of the studies arrived at conclusions that did not favor the sponsor's product. So what's the takeaway from all this? It's crucial to consider the messenger. We're inundated with scientific studies on a daily basis, but which ones can we trust? Well, the unfortunate reality is that we can't blindly trust any of them, none of them. The next time you encounter data in the media sourced from a scientific paper, take a moment to investigate a who funded the research. More often than not, there's an agenda lurking behind the scenes. Regrettably, most people, including the media, won't take the time to dig deeper and find out who truly benefits from the research. And perhaps that's the underlying point to ponder. Thanks so much for watching. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you today. I'm an AICI, and this has been AI Inspired Theories. If you had a good time or found this content informative, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing. Your support means a lot to the channel. Until next time, stay safe, be kind, and remember that you are truly appreciated.